Take your Bibles, open them to 1 Samuel chapter 20. It's where we are together in 1 Samuel chapter 20, studying through verse by verse. Uh, some of my most favorite section of the scripture after studying the direct life of Jesus is studying the life of David. And I remember the very first time I studied through First and Second Samuel with Pastor Chuck, uh, as we've all studied through the Bible, uh, all the way through from Genesis to Revelation with Pastor Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. It's part of our training, part of our development over the years. And I still listen um, almost weekly to Pastor Chuck. Um, I get this sense of, of a grandfather speaking forth the word of God into my life. And it brings back many fond memories. We, we have those MP3s, by the way, downstairs. Uh, they're available in the bookstore. And I'd encourage you, uh, if that's all the time you have, is just to go through the Bible with Pastor Chuck. It's a very powerful time. And I remember the first time I began studying, I, I remember thinking, is this really in the Bible? It was, I, I hadn't read the Bible straight through before as a new believer. And, and even, if, as, even as I was reading through the Bible, just reading through it, I wasn't pausing enough to let the Bible soak in. And then I started, back then we had, back then we had the tape lending library uh, at the church that I attended, Calvary Chapel Downey. And we were able to get five tapes and we could borrow five tapes for a week. And then we had to bring them back and then say, here are my five tapes. Can I get five more? And I was just so soaking in verse by verse uh, the word of God and, and I remember and I still have some of the original notes from those times it's just a sweet thing uh, as David becomes that type of Christ in so many ways and in other ways he's not a type of Christ and I would say in this season of his life we see a lot of things that we didn't see in Jesus we see the humanity of David and I think you would agree that life on the run isn't easy. Even if you've never had a life on the run, life on the run is not easy. Many today are living life running away, running away from God, running away from their problems, running away from their past, some running away from the church, running away from leadership, running away from submission, running away from commitment. <clears throat> it's not God's intention for you to live life on the run. Or I should say, running away from God. That's not his heart for you. He doesn't desire for us to spend all of our energy and effort trying to avoid what God's desire is for our lives. I would say that it is God's desire for us to run in the right direction. You can jot these down. Let me read them to you. Some of the verses I found when it relates to running. For example, in Psalm 119, verse 32, it says, I will run in the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. Or in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. Or in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, it says, do you, not those, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may have obtain it. I mean, run in the ways of the Lord, run in the commandments of the Lord, run in the strength of the Lord so that one day we'll be able to say, like Paul did to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I finished well. I've kept the faith. We're following David now on the run, running away from King Saul, not from God, Although along the way, as he's running away, he makes some mistakes. Pick up with me now in verse 1 of chapter 20. Then David fled from Naoth and Ramah and went and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity? What is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? So Jonathan said to him, By no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? Is it not so? Then David took an oath again and said, Your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. So Jonathan said to David, Whatever you yourself desire, I will do it for you. In fleeing from the city of Naoth, David meets up with Jonathan seeking answers for the increasing craziness of Jonathan's dad. 
Oh, David, Jonathan said, it's not that bad because I know my dad and and my dad would tell me if he was going to do anything. And yet David speaks with wisdom and says, no, 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 no. You, you either, you either don't see it, Jonathan, or you don't want to see it, that things are far worse than they seem. It was so bad that David had this sense of the presence of death in his life. And he says, and I don't think he's being dramatic where he says in verse three, there is a step but between me and death. He recognizes how serious it is. He lived, you could say, with the reality that death was near. He felt it. It was close, just a step away. Now I have to say that most of us, most of the time, don't live with a true consciousness that the life and death are in the hands of the Lord. That it's his timing for your life And it's his timing for your death and mine. We don't always have a sensitivity to the consciousness that we all live just a step away from death. (laughs) This is true in a sense for all of us listening in today. That we are, our life is in the hands of God. Instead, we generally live with the thought that there'll always be tomorrow. Ah, there'll always be tomorrow. We, we even get a sense, especially those of you that are a little younger, that we're immortal, like nothing can touch us. And there's a little bit more risk and, and a little bit more, you know, stepping out in craziness when you're younger. When you get older, not only do you hurt more, but you're just like, nah, I, I don't think so. I, I don't know that it, that that challenge doesn't I, I just sense that. Well, you know, I don't know. You could call it fear. You could call it wisdom. Uh, I call it just wisdom. I would call it wisdom. It's like, I don't think I want to get involved in those things anymore. The truth is we just have today. The truth is there's an urgency in this world. The truth is, is that whatever we do, we need to learn how to do it unto the Lord. The truth is, as James tells us, says, whereas you don't know what will happen tomorrow, you don't know what will happen tomorrow for what is your life. It's even just a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. I think it's important for us to live with a consciousness of life and death. To recognize that our days are in the hands of the Lord. That that he has determined our days and the pre-appointed times of our, and and the habitation, the boundaries of our habitation, Paul would write and talk to, tell us in the book of Acts. That as, as we live, according to the psalmist, that the days have been fashioned for us and we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Yet I have to say this, the real motivation for serving the Lord isn't fear-based. So so you don't take this knowledge and go, well, you know, if I'm not going to be here tomorrow, then I better start serving the Lord because I don't know when I'm going to die. No, the real motivation for serving the Lord isn't a fear of dying. It's the joy of eternal life. It's the joy of living. It's the joy of God giving us life today. It's his love that moves us. It's the love of God and his redeeming power, his tremendous, overwhelming abundance of grace in our life that presses me and moves me and stirs me to serve him today. I mean, we're not looking to die. We're looking for the soon return of Jesus Christ. We're looking to be translated, to be taken up in the twinkling of an eye. I don't know when that's going to happen. And I neither do I know the day of my death. But I'll tell you this. I do know that I'm alive today. And God deserves my best today. Right now. He deserves my all. It's the realization that he could come at any moment. That keeps us growing in grace and serving in God. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 verse 3. That everyone who has this hope purifies himself. This hope of his return. Just as he is pure. How exciting. Jesus is coming again. I don't know when. It could be tonight. It could be tonight. There's one person that wants it to be tonight. It could be tonight. Yeah, I hope it could be tonight. It could be even before we finish this Bible study. Now I know I'll get an amen on that. You're like, oh yeah, finish now. I mean, it could be tonight. The coming of the Lord is at hand, but the world wants to rock you to sleep. The circumstances of life want to get our eyes off him. The, the situations that, you know, we'll always have tomorrow. We'll always have tomorrow. One day you won't have tomorrow. I don't know what day that is. But one day, tomorrows will be gone. And while you've been waiting for tomorrow, so will all your todays. Guys, I know that David really does see the reality of life and death in his life in a very dramatic, strong way. 
while he himself is not being dramatic, he recognizes the reality of the circumstance. He sees death very closely ahead. Just a step, he says. And we learn from that it's a wise way to live with eternity in mind. It's a wise way to live for the coming of the Lord. Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, verse 13, he said he called 10, 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, and he said to them, do business till I come. And David, recognizing the, the fragility of life, is living with eternity in mind. And he tells Jonathan in verse 4, Jonathan tells David, whatever you, des- you yourself desire, I'll do it for you. And David said to Jonathan, indeed, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king to eat. But let me go that I may hide in the field until the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. And if he says thus, it is well, your servant will be safe. But if he is angry, then he'll be sure evil is determined by him. Now, as a member of King Saul's court, it makes sense that David would be expected to be at the feast of the new moon. But David isn't going. And if Saul's response to this will reveal a lot, it will, really, David's pretty confident. He knows what the response will be. And it's not so much for David as it is for Jonathan. The recognition of, the confirmation of what David already knows to be true. Verse 8. Therefore, you shall deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into covenant of the Lord with you. Nevertheless, if there's iniquity in me, kill me yourself. For why should you bring me to your father? And Jonathan said, Far be it from you, for I knew certainly that evil was determined by my father to come upon you. Then would I not tell you? Then David said to Jonathan, Who will tell me? And what if your father answers you roughly? And Jonathan said to David, Come and let us go out into the field. So both of them went out into the field. As this scenario continues, the pressure and the stress and the difficulties begin to grow upon David. And while he is a man after God's own heart, he's still just a man. You can see a little tension in his friendship. Because when there's stress and pressure, the first people to feel it are the people that are closest to you. The people that you spend the most time with. And even in this difficult situation, they're, they're speaking honesty with one another. But you're going to find a rise and an increase of the pressure and stress upon a man. And might I just say that it's important that you not put too much pressure on yourself when you, when you find that you're under stress. I would, I would say that you and I need to be very careful to remember you're just a man and you're just a woman. You're just a normal person. You have emotions, right? You guys have emotions? <laughs> Some of you have different primary emotions, but you have. We're emotional. We're fragile. We have issues at times with our ego and with what people think about us, with where we think we are in life, where we think we should be. Don't be too hard on yourself over your weaknesses and your failures. Obviously, if there are sin issues, you don't need to be hard on yourself with sin issues either. Just repent. Be broken before the Lord. Don't define it as, well, I'm struggling and I'll just never get out of it. No, surrender it to the Lord and God will deliver you. We're going to learn very quickly. Jesus is going to save words of intense, uh, intense freedom when he says, when the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. We're not there yet. We will be soon. You can read ahead in the Gospel of John if you'd like. Life-giving words. Speaking life into very death-filled situations. You don't have to define yourself by your struggles. You can define yourself by the God who overcame your struggles, who died for your forgiveness of your sins. But you know how it is. Some of you are really good at beating yourself up. You don't need anybody beating you up. You're really good at it yourself. You and I being human are beset by, rel- rev- by, by weaknesses, by Well, if you have a weakness in your life, I would like to welcome you to the club. The club of normalcy. And our failures can often lead. It's pride is a nasty thing. Because on one end of the most of the time when I mention pride to you, you automatically think of the most common form of pride, and that is thinking too highly of yourself. But you know the pendulum swings of pride? That sin of pride swings all the way to the other end. And there's also another type of pride of thinking too lowly of yourself. It's a false, another way of the Bible describes it as false humility. 
And you and I, we want to find ourselves not in the pride of thinking too much of ourselves or in the pride of thinking too less of ourselves, but instead of that simple humility before the Lord of thinking of us exactly like God thinks of us, how he defines us. And he recognizes, according to Psalm 103, that we're just dust. That's not, a, that's not a statement putting you down. That's not a statement of putting you in your place. It's simply a statement of fact. We're but dust. We're in the process of growing. God is doing a work in our lives. He is working in us to make us into the image of Jesus Christ. And none of us have arrived. Jesus didn't come to condemn you, so don't condemn yourself. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ. That's good news. That's great news for us. Because the battle gets so heavy, the spiritual war is difficult, and that comes with our besetted failures and weaknesses, guilt and shame, which can easily turn into the heaviness of condemnation. But the Bible says there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation for you and me. Your past sins are forgiven. Your present sins are forgiven. Your future sins are forgiven. The Bible teaches us that there is no condemnation. If you were to look that word up in the Greek, it means no, zero, zippo, whatever you want to say. Salvation is a whole package. All of you is saved. You are kept by the power of God. You're identified by the finished work of Jesus Christ. You're going to have weaknesses. You're going to be human. And too many of you are living under the sense of condemnation, which leads to a false pride, a false humility, which is a form of pride. You know you've done something wrong, and instead of taking the right path, just humbling yourself and repenting before the Lord in godly sorrow, you take the burden of yourself, and then you begin to beat yourself up. And, you know, the idea that the world goes, you know, you won't be able to forgive anyone before you forgive yourself. That's all backwards. You won't be able to to extend forgiveness until you receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And receiving the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, you will then release yourself from the debts that Jesus Christ paid to forgive in your life. It's not about you forgiving yourself. It's about you submitting to the one that forgave you. He will do the work in your life. David's human here. You're going to see a lot of humanity in him. You go, but God, did God use him? Yeah. Yeah, God used him, even with all of his weaknesses. The thing that I believe that God is pulling out for us is the ugliness of pressure and stress. I'm not going to ask for a, a raise of hands, but I'm gonna, I, I know that the, the, the flags would start waving in here if I, when I ask this question. How many of you experienced a stress-filled, pressure-filled day today? Of course. And some of you are under intense pressure right now. It hasn't let up. It's not letting up right now. Some of you are in the mode, and and I'm with you, man. I understand this, where you're just like, when's it going to end? I mean, I I can't, I don't, I can't even believe this is, I mean, mean, and it's almost like you're like Job. You're like, think God forgot you. God didn't forget about you. But that does, just because pressure is increasing doesn't mean God has abandoned you. Doesn't mean God is using that pressure to draw you to himself. Man, don't you wish that life was without pressure, but it's not. Stress will, will eat you up on the inside, but it also mess with your head. Stress will lead to suspicion. Pressure will lead often to paranoia. There's a lot of focus on how King Saul's getting paranoid, but you know, David has his paranoid moments too. You had somebody chasing you that was crazy with spears. You'd feel the same way. <clears throat> Running through the wilderness of the southern part of Israel, it's, it's not easy. When you're under deep stress and pressure, be careful with the reality of your own emotions. Be honest. Commit them to the Lord. The Bible says to be careful with vain imaginations. Don't entertain them. Admit that you're an emotional wreck. Everybody else admits it. Why don't you? Say, man, that brother needs some prayer. Well, pray. That sister's really going over. Yes, I know. It's hard. Their life is hard. Pray for them. They don't need you to point their finger. We, they know they're messed up. They know they're hurting. They know they're fearful. I mean, there's probably things in their life that you don't even know about. You just see the outward. Pray. That's, seek God. And even when you, the, you know, this thing with Jonathan and David, I mean, that's a great friendship. And they even had a little argument here. They even went through it. And there's a little bit, wait a minute, Dave, you know, even that question, Jonathan, whose side are you on? 
I mean, they had a great friendship, but it was under stress as well. Can I give you a piece of advice? Well, even if you said no, you're going to have to hear it anyway. <clears throat> when you're under great stress and pressure, when you're under great, you might want to jot this down. I don't see anybody getting a pen out or anything. You might want to jot this down, write it on your hand, type it out really fast on your iPad. It'll save your, you, I will save you, I will save you a lot of grief and heartache in life if you can pray through this and what it, how it gets applied in your life. But when you're under great stress and when you're under great pressure, don't make big decisions. Profound, but true. Don't make big decisions under press and pressure and stress. Wait for the Lord to give you direction. That could be the pressure or stress you put on yourself it could be everybody in your life going, you got to do this and you got to do it right now. I don't know how to do anything but obey the Lord. When, especially when it's really rough and things aren't so clear. Wait on the Lord. Be careful under deep stress with the reality of your emotions. Don't make big decisions. Don't come to any huge conclusions. Just wait on the Lord. So they both head out into the field together Back in chapter 20, verse 12. Then Jonathan said to David, the Lord God of Israel is witness. When I have sounded out to my father sometime tomorrow or the third day, and indeed there's good toward David, and I do not send to you and tell you, may the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. But if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I will report it to you and send you away that you may go in safety. And the Lord be with you as he's been with my father. And you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemy. So Jonathan promises him to tell him the truth. What a friend. He, he doesn't, he's not offended by David's pressure or stress he gets through the disagreement and they come to an agreement he tells him i'm going to tell him the truth verse 17 and jonathan again caused david to vow because he loved him for he loved him as his own soul then jonathan said to david verse 18 tomorrow's the new moon and you'll be missed because your seat will be empty and when you've stayed three days go down quickly and come to the place where you hid on the day of the deed and remain by the stone ezel you might want to mark that Mark that phrase. We'll come back to it in a moment. Then I'll shoot three arrows to the side of it as though I shot at a target. And there I'll send a lad saying, go, find the arrows. If I expressly say to the lad, look, the arrows are on the side of you. Get them and come. Then, as the Lord lives, there's safety for you and no harm. But if I say thus to the young man, look, the arrows are beyond you. Go your way. The Lord has sent you away. For the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter, verse 23, which you and I have spoken of, indeed the Lord be between you and me forever. King Saul used a spear as a weapon to destroy David, while Jonathan uses an arrow as a tool to communicate with David. I mean, it takes a lot of faith to stand in the, in the area of coming arrows after, you know, his dad's been chucking spears at you and, and throwing, I mean, it's, it's, it's neat, it's, it's really neat to show that really, the weapon itself is really defined by the hand that it's in. <laughs> it's so beautiful how God can redeem anything. And he says in verse 19 to go to the stone or the rock Ezel. If you like to write in your Bibles, you can jot next to it. It literally means the rock that shows the way. That was the counsel. You go to the rock that shows the way. And that's where you'll find direction, David. David was to stay close to that rock to learn which way he was to go. He was at a critical time in his life and he needed help and direction. Where was he sent? He was sent to the rock that shows the way. Does that sound familiar to you? Jesus known as the rock. And in times of great crisis, you're to go to the rock that shows you the way. So beautiful. Perhaps that's you right now. You're in a critical point in your life at a crossroads worried you don't know what is going to happen you don't know what you're supposed to do you don't know where you're supposed to go and you just can't figure it out the good news is that God will direct you how by going to the rock that will show you the way by coming back to the Lord 
That is to go to Jesus, the wisdom for life. Somebody asked me recently, just right now, actually, before service, I was in my office uh, in the hour between the radio program and the time that we're here out uh, ministering at six o'clock. I was just checking in on a brother and, and he was checking in. He's giving me his update and I'm praying for him because he's going. It's a pastor friend of mine under great pressure and stress, a church planter uh, who just lost his job and, and, and actually he's been knocking on doors. Uh, you guys as a church have helped him. Uh, and supported him and helped him through a crisis time in his life. And you do that many, many times throughout the year with all kinds of people around the world. Around the world, this church is very faithful in serving. And it's anonymous and behind the scenes, and it's just as unto the Lord. So I was say, checking in on him, and he was checking in on me. And he says, well, how are you doing? And I said, well, you know, the last couple of weeks have been very discouraging, and I've been in a deep place of discouragement. And, and yet, when I put my eyes on the Lord... I'm not so discouraged. So when I'm sitting there just looking at my situation and, and, and having to process it all and it's so unfair, you ever feel like that? It's so unjust, you ever feel like that? It's like, Lord, why don't you just, uh, like from every, what are you doing? When I'm there, it's difficult. But I also described it this way. So I've been in other times of discouragement and it's not like that where I would go from bed to couch to bed. That was my days for month after month after month after month. I'd just go from bed, and whenever I felt like getting up, I'd go, and I'd just, veg, I'd just turn it. It didn't even matter what was on television. It could have been static. It wouldn't matter to me. I was just sitting on the couch just wondering what, what's going to happen with my life. I said, it's not like that. Um, but discouragement, it comes like in waves. And I don't mean sadness. I mean, when I get my eyes back on the Lord, discouragement becomes sadness. And sadness is just a real feeling of the reality of the situation in your life. And the reality of, you know, but discouragement is like, I don't know if it'll ever change. Sadness is, I don't like it right now. Discouragement is, oh, I don't know. I don't know if it's ever going to change. And, and Lord, don't you see what it's doing to my wife? And Lord, don't you see what it's doing to my kids? And Lord, don't you see? And what does he tell me? Where does he have me? Why don't you go to the Rocky Zell, Ed? And I'll say, because I don't want to. And the Lord says, well, then you'll have the consequences of your sin, not trusting me. You have the consequences of your sin, not looking to me. Yeah, but if I go to the rocky zell, maybe the arrows will hit me. Well, you just need to go to the rocky zell and trust that I put the arrows in the right hands. Yeah, but what if I'm sitting by the stony zell? And, and, and of course, what happens when you're dialoguing? You have to read the book of Job and just go all, forget the book of Job, all of it. Just go to the last chapter. And let the Lord speak to you his word for his season. I know many of you are discouraged, but maybe some of you listening in right now are from the bed to the couch to the bed, and that's your life. I encourage you, go back to the stony zell. Yeah, but I've been to the stony zell, and I'm still sad. Sadness is different than discouragement. Sadness is a reality of life. It's an emotion. There's many things in life that make us sad. But discouragement... Is not looking to the Lord. So many times we feed sadness and it becomes discouragement. You know what happens when you feed discouragement? It becomes depression. Oh, forgive me for those of you that have issues chemically. I'm not speaking to that. You go, what do you mean? I just can't that be chemical? Yeah, it, it, depression comes a lot of different ways. You misunderstand me. Sadness nurture becomes discouragement. Discouragement nurtured also will become depression. Depression nurtured will often become despair. And despair nurtured. Well, let's not even go there. Let's come back to the rocky zell. You'll despair of life, you know. You'll think that the world will be better off without you. You'll begin to think that the, you'll be better off without the world. And I just want you to know that's not from the Lord. Come back. Come back to the place where the Lord, the rock that shows the way. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. You are uniquely created. There's no one else like you. And maybe you're discouraged today. Maybe you've been nursing sadness. Maybe you're at a crossroads. Maybe you're fearful. The Bible says that Jesus Christ became wisdom for us. He's the rock that shows the way. God blesses us in spite of ourselves as we simply find ourselves going back to the rock or to the stone Ezel, the rock that shows the way. Not only that, but I, I find that God will give you the direction when you need it. 
God will speak into your life when you need it. Yeah, but Ed, what about five years from now? Remember, we have today. And I find that God will speak into your life when you need it. It's, it's very similar to what I found as I raised my, <coughs> raising my kids. <coughs> Excuse me. Very similar. Even as I pastor and shepherd as a leader, you know, and I have the privilege of raising my kids uh, or serving others, you know, I just didn't give them direction all the time when everything was going well. I didn't just speak into their life when everything was going well. I was always looking for those opportunities where God would just open the door and I could speak into their life in that moment. I wasn't telling them when they were five, you know what, you know, you're five, but, but when you're 15, you're going to go through the worst crisis in your life. So let me just get you ready for it. No, I couldn't speak that into their life until they needed it. And believe me, when they needed it, I spoke into their life, even as the Lord does that in my life. I gave them the word and I gave them my advice and I gave them direction right where they were. I sought them out. I looked for the right opportunity, the right timing to interject myself into their lives. The Lord does the same thing. You need to come back to the stony zell. And by that rock, David was to wait for the message. And so in a time of waiting, make sure you're waiting by the rock. Not in bed, to the couch, to the bed, to the couch. In those dark and gloomy days. Open up the blinds. Let the light of, well, not this morning, but other days of the sunlight coming in. <laughs> Verse 24. So David hid in the field, and when the new moon had come, the king sat down to eat the feast. And the king sat on his seat as at other times on a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose and Abner sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought something has happened to him. He's unclean. Surely he's unclean. And it happened the next day, the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, why has the son of Jesse not come to eat, either yesterday or today? And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked permission of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, please let me go for our family has a sacrifice in the city and my brother has commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore, he has not come to the king's table. And then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan. He said, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. That was an encouragement. <laughs> Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? Remember, Jonathan is going to get the kingdom, but Jonathan has willingly submitted to the anointing of the king. That was rightfully his according to the law of the land. But according to God, he was wise and he submitted to the anointing of God. And that's what Saul's going, what are you doing? What a shameful thing you're doing. You're allowing, you're allowing David the place that belongs to you is what, basically what he's saying, verse 31. And he's not saying something very nice about his mom either. Verse 31, as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established, nor your kingdom. Now therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Ah, Jonathan, now you know. Now you know. It was right out of your dad's lips. And Jonathan answered Saul's father and said to him, why should he be killed? What has he had done? And Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, by which Jonathan knew it was determined by his father to kill David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had treated him shamefully. When Saul noticed David's absence, he first thought something had happened to him or was ceremonially unclean, but he finally realized something was happening and he sensed that Jonathan was willing to give up his right to the kingdom. And what does he do? He throws a spear at his own son. How far from God do you need to be to harm and hurt your own kids? Very far. Remember the teaching of Jesus repeated again in the Proverbs is to love my enemies. Jot it down in Matthew chapter 4. You see, if I don't love or pray for my enemies, then like King Saul, I'll find myself out even to, I'll find myself so upset that I'll even take out my own family members. You can't confine hatred toward one person or control it toward just one group. It will spill over. And here he's ready to kill his own son. 
That is the sad tale throughout the scriptures <clears throat> that men and women that were far from God would use their, even their own kids as manipulative tools or take out their own kids or like, friends, our attention, the Bible says in the last days that God is gonna turn the hearts of the fathers back toward the kids. It's going to be a time where the, there is going to be a, such an a emphasis and explosion of discipleship of our own kids, no matter what the age Grandchildren, great-grandchildren. It's never too late to turn your heart back towards your kids. To disciple them and to grow them. And if you don't have access to them, to pray for them. If they're being withheld from you, pray for them. If they're far from you, pray for them. If they don't want to talk to you, pray for them. But if you're in their life, disciple them. Give them the word. Direct them. And here, Saul... I mean, it's, it's sad. Verse 33, it's, it's a sad verse. Now, verse 35. And so it was in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed by David, or appointed with David, and a little lad was with him. <clears throat> and he said to the lad, Now run, find the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the lad had come to the place where the arrow was, which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried out after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond you? Jonathan cried out after the lad, Make haste, hurry, do not delay. So Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came back to his master, but the lad did not know anything. Only Jonathan David knew of the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to his lad and said to him, Go, carry them to the city. Now as soon as the lad had gone, David arose from a place toward the south, <clears throat> fell on his face to the ground, bowed down three times, and they kissed one another, and they wept together, but David more so. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, May the Lord be between you and me, between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Jonathan went out into the field. He gave the sign, the signal to David. Jonathan will never see David again after this point. Their friendship, well, at least the joy of their friendship, ends in lives being saved. It ends while they lost, other people benefited. And I just love Jonathan. It would be a study in and of its own, the characteristics of this man, how God used him. He's a, he becomes a picture for us what true friendship looks like, true fidelity, true loyalty to David, and ultimately to the Lord at whatever cost. So beautiful. And once again, we'll find David on the run, We'll find David in very difficult circumstances in our coming chapters. And I just encourage you, our last final word uh, for us before we head out is, as I pray, some of you just really need to practically in your mind come back to the rock or to the stony zell, the rock that shows the way. God has a word for you. He has direction for you. He can take you back from despair. You don't have to go through all of the, the you don't have to go backwards, you know. You know, in baseball, when uh, you go and you're running and you run to first and you run to second, you run to third and there's a pop fly and they catch it, you have to go back to first, but you've got to touch all the bases to go back. You can't like on T-ball just run all over the place wherever you want and then run back, which it's fun to watch, but that's not the rules. The rules of baseball is if you get all the way to third on a high pop fly and they catch it, in order for you not to be out also, you've got to run all the way back in order. So if you're on third, you've got to go back to second and back to first, and that's why most people are out. That's why most people don't run that far. They wait. They go halfway. But with the Lord, if you find yourself in a place that you don't belong, you don't have to go all through all the steps to get back. He can take you all, back, all the way back to T-ball and you can just run wherever you want straight back to the Lord. You can just come straight back. You can come in a squiggly line if you want. You can come and throw dirt in the air like the kids do. You can throw your hat in the air. You can do whatever you want, but just come back to the Lord. You don't have to come back on all the different steps. So you find yourself in great despair and you go, well, if I'm despair, I better get back to discouragement or depression. And from de you don't, don't worry about all that. I was only giving you the progress to show where you are in your distance from the Lord. But if you want to come back, just come back. Just come back with that discouragement. Lay it at the rocky zell and wait for the answer of the Lord. If you stick around in places, you may find a few spears that you can avoid. You may be in a place where, man, you, you just, you, you come back away from the spear and you come back to the one whose hands were speared for you. 
and you can come back to a place of strength. And it's not your strength, is it? It's the grace of God. It's not your physical strength, and it's not your ability, and it's not you picking yourself up by your bootstraps and I'll get through this. You're just like, man, Lord, I know I couldn't make it without you. I trust you today. And I know you're coming back, and I want to serve you. And here I am at the Rocky Zell. Show me the way. Show me the way, Lord. Give me the direction. And I just want to thank you for your prayers, your encouragement. Sometimes you don't even know what you're praying for. Most of the time I never tell you, at least what's going on in my life. But you just pray. You pray for your pastor. You pray for your pastors. You pray for their wives. You pray for their kids. You go, but Ed, Pastor Ed, I don't know any of that. Well, why not? Why haven't you asked? Is there a pastor on your heart? Email them and say, what are you, you got kids? And then watch when the pastor goes, yeah, I have 35 kids. You don't even know all 30 of my kids? They're all over the place. They're screaming and yelling. And it took me a year just to get back to your email, man. And I just like, yeah, but you, you don't, if there's a pastor on your heart, you just ask them. I mean, ask them. They, the pastors go through crazy stuff, man. You'd be, you'd be amazed of the things that we have to deal with in, during a week. You'd be amazed. You're just like, what? That happens? Yeah. And stuff we don't even know. The enemy just loves to discourage and distract and destroy and... And he's not come but except to kill, steal, and destroy. And I know your life's crazy, but so is ours. So pray for us. And maybe you'll adopt a pastor in your own heart. Maybe you'll pray for all of them. But you'll just adopt one in your own heart. So do you have kids? Well, yeah, this is going on, and this is going on. And this is a place where we need to be supportive of one another, encouraging one another. And, and I know you can't do everything, but you can do something. So pray. And as you're praying for someone else, you may even find the outlet of that prayer is also then the outlet where the Lord's pouring encouragement into your heart. And together, we're going to make it all the way to heaven. Why? Because of the grace of God. And then you're going to get to heaven, I'm going to get to heaven, I'm going to look at you, I go, you made it? <laughs> and then you're going to look at me, yeah, but you made it too, bro. And we're going to be high, high five in because the only reason either one of us are there is by the grace of God, man. It's his goodness and his finished work and what he's done in our lives. And so, God, we thank you for the privilege of serving you. And, and we are looking forward to the heavenly home, but we know we're not in heaven yet. We're walking through a very hostile world, a world that we're not citizens of, a world that we don't belong, a world where we feel like aliens, a world where we're just pilgrims. I know we have a house or an apartment or we rent a room, but it feels like a tent, Lord. It feels temporary. And forgive us when we put our roots down. Forgive us when we neglect. Forgive us when we, well, when we nurture these sadnesses and these things in our lives where we need to set them before you, Lord. We, we need to be about the Father's business. We, we need to make the stone of Ezel. If we don't go to the stone of Ezel, we need to take it with us. And we need to be in the place, the rock that shows the way. And I thank you, Lord, for being the cornerstone of our lives that you will be the one that shows us the way. And we run to you today. That's why we're in Bible study. That's why we have our computer on. That's why our, I got that little Bible study on my phone, why my radio is tuned, because I need to hear of heaven. I long for heaven. I want to be in heaven. Many people that I love are in heaven, Lord, and I pray that I would long for your soon return to see you face to face and to trust you day by day for your loving grace. And I pray for my brother that I mentioned earlier. I pray you'd open a door to get him a job, Lord. He, he has a heart to do your work. He's laid his whole life and family on the line to serve in the ministry. And while the church isn't large enough to support him yet, Lord, I pray you'd open the door for a position, a place, for him to use his gifts and talents so you could continue to work in the, uh, in the church and it would grow and it would be a lighthouse in that community. And so I pray for his discouragement right now. I pray your hand would be upon him. I pray, God, that, that he would not grow weary in well-doing, but in due season he'll reap if he doesn't lose heart. And so, God, we thank you for your faithfulness in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. And Sorry I went a little over, but um, it's Wednesday. And we got all this prayer. We went over because of prayer. That's a good reason. We went over because we have Bella, man. She's going out to serve the Lord. I hope she inspires you. And, uh, if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ, come up. Admit that you sin. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to raise your hand or just come up and talk to somebody. Confess with your mouth. Believe with your heart. 
Uh, if you need prayer, this may be the Lord's touched you through part of the message. The pastors will be up here to encourage you, to uplift you, uh, to serve you. Pray for your pastors. Get to know them. Send them a note. Ask them, to, what, can they be, what can you be praying for them? We should have like a pastor of the week on our app, huh? <laughs> Ian's first. Because <laughs> you guys have been sending all these complaints to him. And Do you have a complaint? Take it to the Lord. Go to the Rocky Zell. No more. Ian's email has been forwarded to the Rocky Zell. But may the Lord bless you and encourage you. May you stand strong. Only by the grace of God do we stand. We have today, so we'll use it under the glory. Disciple those precious kids of yours. It's a privilege to be in their life. You disciple those grandkids. You pour into them. It's a privilege in your life to be a part of their lives. So you pour into them. You pray for them. You give yourself over to them. You disciple them. As a church will support you, but you disciple those kids in the way we live. If they're not walking with the Lord right now, let me just pray. God, for the prodigals that are represented in the family right now, boys and girls, men and women, our hearts break for them. We break for them not for the pain that we're feeling as much as for the pain that they're feeling, that their lack of relationship with you, their dabbling in the world, the relationship that they're in, the stuff that they've seen, the things that they felt, God, we pray and we claim their names right now to bring them back to yourself. We ask for you to do a radical work in their life. Wherever they're at right now, they would have a strange sensation of your presence, that you have not left them, you have not forsaken them. Even if they've turned their back on you, you haven't turned your back on them. And we claim them today. We pray you would bring them back, that we would look forward to the rejoicing of just like the Father, we would just run and be so happy that their lives would be spent, invested in you. So we pray for the prodigals tonight. Any age, any place, any reason, bring them back, Lord. Jesus.